Your internet connects ahead, unfortunately. I gotta turn on my Instagram back on. So it will be two recordings. Almost yeah, there. that's fine, mate. No problem at all. Give me two minutes. No problem at all, Jay. You do what you got to do. How are things going with you? Pretty good, mate. Pretty good. Can't complain. How about yourself? Oh, good. It's morning time right now. Yeah. Yeah. Friday evening here. So just sitting here having a little beer as you do. Cheers. Cool. Okay. Okay, Jay, you all set, chat? Yes, all set. Cool. All right. So we had technical difficulties on Instagram, so we're going to just do on Skype. And later on, um, I'll post it on YouTube. Yeah, so cool. how are you doing during this lockdown? Uh, it's been a bit weird, isn't it? Uh, I mean, none of us have ever really sort of experienced anything like this before, so it's quite surreal. Uh, fortunately, I'm still at work at the moment. Uh, I haven't been furloughed or, uh, you know, self-isolated or anything like that. So life is pr pretty normal still to a certain extent. Uh, but obviously, it's one of those things, isn't it, that we've got to just get on with it. We've, uh, the UK has been put on another three weeks lockdown and uh, we've just got to live with it and hope that it's over sooner rather than later. Oh, just just wondering, um, because a lot of us are temporary off work due to this lockdown and you say you're work, uh, yeah, working. Yeah. Uh, what do you do for work? Uh, well, I work for uh, a sort of fairly well-known uh, engine building company that make okay. race car engines. Uh, they're not a rich company, can't really afford to close down completely. Uh, it's probably about 250, 300 people work there. They've all been furloughed or been sent home to work from home, apart from about 40 of us that have had to remain on site because we can't, we basically, we can't do our jobs from home. And obviously we're just trying to keep the company ticking over. Um, how are the rules there? Because certain part of California, like you got, we have to wear masks or like different cities, couple different cities, you could get a ticket for not wearing a mask. So how, how's the rules there in England? No, it's not, not quite as strict as that. Uh, at work, we've got sort of certain instructions that we have to stick to with regards to self-isolating, uh, sorry, to uh, social distancing. Uh, we're doing a lot of cleaning. Uh, we're keeping every, you know, every surface is getting wiped over to at least twice a day, if not mm -hmm. more. We're all sort of responsible for keeping our own areas clean, uh, you know, and just sort of trying to fight it that way, and obviously trying to maintain the uh, the two metre distance from from your colleagues. Not easy, but you know, it's, it's something obviously we have to do. Okay, how have you been? How have you been spending your time when you're not working? Uh, same as usual, really, uh, just at home with the family. Uh, that's, that's it. But as I say, I'm, I've, I've still been at work. So things feel pretty much the same to me, if you know what I mean, during the day, it's just in the evenings when you're at home and you can't go out or you can only go out for a certain amount of exercise one time a day. Yeah, it's weird. It's really weird. And like I say, hopefully it's, uh, it'll all be over quite soon with a bit of luck. I know, I think when this is over, when everything cools down, the world's gonna be different now. With all, all this happening, it'll be different. Well, yeah, yeah, possibly, hopefully. I mean, it needed to be a bit different, didn't it, really? Mm -hmm. I, I've had a couple of little rants on Facebook sort of over the last few weeks. I, I was a bit disappointed, but 
probably not surprised uh, how people were sort of panic buying and things like that. You know, it sort of seemed to bring the sort of the selfishness out in people. You know, I'm all right, look after myself, sod everybody else. And that's a bit of a shame. But then, like I say, not, not altogether surprising, really. Okay. So are you ready for the anti-sec interview? Absolutely, yeah. Far away, mate. I'm prepared to take your questions and answer them as truthfully and, and as accurately as I possibly can. Okay, let's start with the short history. How did you first get involved with punk rock and, and from punk rock? How did you get into all the, uh, the anarcho punk and the peace punk stuff? How did we get involved in that? Yeah, how did you first get involved with punk rock? I first got involved in punk rock around about the age of 13, 14. Uh, I went to see the UK Subs on uh, another kind of blues album tour at uh, Northampton County Ground. Uh, and it just blew my mind. <laughs> you know, punk was there waiting for me. I was a little bit too young to sort of miss the first wave. You know, I was, I was born in 65, so... I was only like 11, 12 years old in 77. So I got into it a little bit later, about 79. Uh, but after seeing the subs, it just it just blew me away. <laughs> Absolutely blew me away. It was what I was looking for. I'd always had a little bit of a bit of a problem with authority. I got into trouble with the police a sort of couple of times. And uh, Punk just gave me that sort of outlet, you know, anger, you know, and sort of do what you want. And it's just it was just great. Brilliant. Uh, obviously, as time went by, we got into uh, bands like Crass, which is where we sort of became more of the anarcho leaning came from. When when did uh, from there when you got into Crass? Uh, what year did Anti Six started, and how old were you? We started in eighty two, if I remember rightly. Uh, We'd been sort of messing around with sort of various bands. I was in a, uh, a band with some friends in Daventry uh, called UK Paranoia. Didn't really do we didn't really do much with them. Uh, we all learned how to play Warhead on the bass, and that was probably about it. Uh, Pete Lyons was in another band called Xylem at the time with some uh, local lads that lived in one of the villages near Daventry. Uh, and it was round about sort of the end of 81, 82 when... Pete Lyons and Polly, the drummer, or the, the to-be drummer, uh, asked me if I was interested in forming a band with them. And uh, said, yeah, why not? You know, couldn't really sort of think of anything else to do. And, uh, you know, away we went. And and from there, you guys have two demo tape out. It's, it's on a, like a bootleg vinyl now. That's right, yeah. We... Uh, we recorded uh, one of the demos in London. That would be the first demo. Uh, the other one we recorded, I think, somewhere in the Midlands, somewhere like Birmingham or something like that. Not not quite sure. I can't, I can't remember. It's a long, long time ago. Uh, yes. But obviously, we were we were always sort of hoping that we'd be able to get a, a record deal. We were hoping to probably sign to something like Clay, but. Mike Stone weren't really interested in us. That didn't happen. And uh, right we got picked discharge. up by... Discharge label, right? Yeah. Mike Stone claimed. Yeah. Why, why wasn't yeah. Mike interested? Sorry, Jay, I didn't get any of that. You repeat um, that, please. Why was the Mike from Clay Records interested on, on getting anti sick on the label? Well, I'm not really sure that he was. Uh... When, when we played with uh, Discharge at the Zigzag Club in London, when we mm -hmm. toured with them, uh, we did have a sort of bit of a conversation with Mike. Uh, and we, we were hoping that we might get a, a deal with Clay because, we, you know, we, we were a young band, uh, you know, an up and coming band. Uh, you know, we, we, we wanted to make a record. That was something we wanted to do. But it never happened. Obviously, as everybody knows, with Clay Records, as I say, I don't think Mike Stone was interested in us. So it didn't happen. How was Discharge at that time? Because uh, Kyle, Kyle was singing at that time. I, I, love, I love that lineup, Discharge, when you guys played with them. How was Discharge at that time? What, musically? 
yeah, both musically and also as people. Absolutely fantastic. They were, they, they came and played a, a gig in Northampton and uh, we all went to see them. And uh -huh. uh, I think, yeah, I reckon Andy said we were, yeah, we were a band at that time. And I'm not sure how long we'd been a band, but we were a band. And they just absolutely blew our socks off. They were just absolutely just brutal, raw, sort of brutal. And uh, we got chatting to them after the gig. And, you know, they were really nice guys as well. And obviously, uh, they did us a good turn a little bit later on by uh, by taking us on tour to support them, you know, which I'm forever right, you know, indebted to them for that, really. We had some great times, did some great gigs and had some great times with them. Yeah, they were smashing blokes. Wow. How many how many gigs did you play with the Discharge? We did a tour with them. Uh, you know what? Jay, I can't tell you, I couldn't even tell you how many gigs we did. It must have been six, eight, maybe more. Again, wow. really can't remember. But it was, a, it was a few days, yeah. That's cool. That's when Discharge were on the Prime, too. That's awesome. And then you guys have all, all those songs, the live songs that never went in the studio from Pieces Better Than a History, like songs like Resist, yeah. Resist and Exist. They were all like super fast. How come those yeah. songs never yeah. went in the, in the studio? And it's only on live. Uh, because I think we were we were a band that was forever evolving. You know, we 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 didn't want to sort of rest on our laurels, and we were always trying to sort of do something different. I agree, though. I think it's a shame that we didn't put uh, track like "Resist and Exist," maybe "Aftermath," uh, "Bright and a Thousand Suns," uh, you yes. know, all the tracks off of the. Uh, the piece is better album yeah it would have i think it would have been great if we'd have put them uh down uh in the studio but it just never happened you know we either didn't have the time to do it or we didn't have the money to pay for a studio it, it would have probably been one or both of those things or probably many other things yeah brighter than ten thousand times the sun i love that song i love it when richard hill would do a poem in the when he do poetry yeah. the, the um I forgot the poem. Was some kind of punk, yeah. punk rock poem or something many years ago? That's awesome. Then, then from there, you guys did an album called "In Darkness, There's No Choice." Was that on Flux of Pink Indians label? Spider. Uh, it was, yeah, yeah. We we started playing gigs with uh, Flux. We did quite a few gigs with them. Got on them really well. Uh, Colin Latter singer was a great guy he, he sort of took quite an interest in us uh we got on with all of them they were they, again they were nice people uh and i'm not not 100 sure how it came about but uh uh flux did have their own label spider leg records and uh they asked us or you know it was decided that we would uh, that we would go on that label with them uh and colin produced the album uh and yeah, the rest is history, really. On the demo tape, you were the only vocalist. What made you uh, bring in Richard Richard Hill to sing um, as a second vocalist? I think, as we say, Jay, we were we were changing quite a lot. We were sort of evolving, and I think we thought if we brought in another vocalist uh, to have like the dual vocal attack, it'd just give us a little bit of an extra dynamic. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was thought sort of rich had a great voice you know much much better voice than, than my, my own here yeah, you know really powerful really sort of gravelly and uh you know both of us together i'd like to think that it worked out uh, pretty good and on the in darkness album there's a big poster fold out and there's a really amazing art in there it's like really dark with the child with the missiles uh, reaching out the sky and stuff yeah. and um who who is that artwork done by? The artwork was done by a guy called Fish. Uh, he was from Nottingham, or if, you know, he's from maybe still there. I don't know. I don't know the guy's real name, uh, but uh, he was a friend. I think he might have put us up uh, one time after we did a gig in Nottingham, uh, uh -huh. and we just sort of got to know him, become mates. And uh, yeah, he he did all the uh, he did all the artwork for the for the center of the album, and uh, yeah, pretty 
pretty impressive drawing, really. I still, you know, still quite impressed by that. And then I have a question too on the vinyl. The, the on the vinyl of the picture, the, there was a baby fetus on it. Did by any chance did that has to do with just life in general, or did it have to do with abortion? I was really confused by looking at it. What did that have to do with the baby fetus? Is it just like a life of human beings? Right. No, it, it was nothing to do with abortion. It wasn't pro-life or anti-life or anything like that. It was exactly as you just said there. It was just life, you know, a baby, a human being, a fetus. Yeah. Yes. And what's what's lyrics did you wrote on, from that album? Sorry, Jay. Can you say that again? I didn't get that. Oh, what lyrics? What songs did you wrote in that album? Song titles that you you wrote. On your own, which, which lyrics I wrote? Yes, uh, the, pretty much the whole album, uh, lyric-wise, was written by myself and Lippy Pete Lyons. Uh, we used to sort of sit up after night, day after day, you know, till the small hours, just sort of chatting, philosophizing, all sorts of things like that, and basically writing lyrics. Uh, we may have written one or two of the songs ourselves sort of individually but the majority of them uh were written both by myself and pete lines along with all the liner notes that are in on the album which i'm sure you've probably read yourself jay uh again that was all sort of written by uh myself and pete lines oh wow that's cool was anti-sec at that time all members of anti-sec were you guys all living together as a collective we did at times, uh, not always. I mean, because remember, we started off as a four piece. Uh, when we became a six piece, then yeah, we, we we didn't all live together, but some of us did. You know, uh, again, things chopping and changing all the time. N nothing ever sort of stayed the same for too long. But uh, yeah, we we were like a proper little family, I, I guess. Yeah. Yes. And from there, um, Carol was doing bulk of, how do you pronounce, is it Carol or Carol? Carol, she did back of vocals. It's Carol, Caroline, but Ka Carol, uh, Kaz yes. for short, or Caro yes. for short, as she's, she's known as well, yeah? Yes. And she did back of vocals on that album. And, uh, um, but then after the recording was over, I saw it on YouTube. It was a YouTube channel that I saw of you guys live, there was all these songs, just you and Caroline, but Richard wasn't on the recording, all these new songs. You, you guys almost had enough songs to do an album and it was really amazing. Like mm -hmm. um, it was, you guys even did songs from out, out from the boy seven inch and you were singing those songs. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Uh, the act, the act from the void uh, song, uh, that was actually written by Lippy, if I remember rightly. I think all the lyrics were written by Lippy, and the music would have been obviously the rest of the guys, uh, which would have been John Bryce and Polly and uh, Pete Lyons. We did do uh, at least one gig where we played that live with myself on vocals. Uh, I think at that point, Rich must have moved on for whatever reason. Uh, and we sort of became a five piece again. The three, three guys on the instruments, myself and Kaz. Uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I noticed uh, from that recording that a lot of people haven't heard. It was guitar was going more sounding was more heavier, but it was a little slower. And then I was yeah. like so surprised she was doing more vocals. Caroline was doing more vocals and stuff. And it yeah. was really cool. It's a shame that I never went to any of the studio recording and stuff. But as lyric wise, was a, what was yeah. the message? Really the same or a little different? No, I think the message was pretty much the same, but I think that Lippy had written the, the words sort of uh so that things weren't sort of so direct it was a little bit more subtle but yeah the message i think was definitely the same that, that the message that we'd always uh that we'd always been there sort of standing behind yeah yes in the old days 
when you guys weren't doing anti anti say what uh, what activism work um, would you guys do like activist stuff on what issues when you're not doing the band when we weren't doing the band we'd be doing what sorry like when you're taking a break from the band were you guys doing any act activist stuff like example with working with any different organizations or um, going to protests or doing other things besides music? Oh, yeah, we, we were all very active, uh, very active, you know, uh, things like the peace camps that we used to visit. Uh, there was a lot of the animal rights things that we were into that we, uh, you know, uh, hunt sabs, uh, you know, raids, all, all sorts of things like that. Oh, can you can you give us short little information about? I mean, people who don't know what a hunt sabbing is. Okay, uh, basically fox hunting. You know, a sport that's uh, now banned in this country, but still continues uh, illegally, and they get away with it. Basically, we'd go uh, we'd go and try and stop them hunting foxes. Simple as that. You know, normally through sort of non-violent sort of direct action means, uh, but you know, there, there were sort of one or two instances where things got a bit, got a bit. Uh, well, people had emotions that get quite high, you know. Didn't it sounds like you guys blow horns and disrupt and make a lot of noise so the fox will run away and, and hunters can't shoot them? Yeah, You're yeah, following. exactly. A anything make lots of noise. Uh, anything that we could do to try and disrupt you know, disrupt uh, the, the, the hunting of the fox, basically. Mm -hmm. And then from there, after after the In Darkness album, you guys were about to go on tour. Um, why did you leave Antisec? Uh, in, in 1985, uh, right. The reason I left Antisect was because I was suffering from, uh, I think, You'd probably call it clinical depression and anxiety. Uh, uh -huh. Something that had been something that had been building up in me for probably like a couple of years before '85, uh, mm. and I just got to the point where I just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it anymore. Uh, we were due to do a tour with Dirt, uh, another UK and Arco band that you'll I'm sure you're well familiar with, Jay. Uh, and I love basically. Yeah, well, there you go. And basically, I dropped antisecting the shit by uh, by leaving the band on the day of the uh, the tour started. And it was basically because they came to pick me up, and we had a little bit of a bit of an argument. And I think the way that I was feeling at the time, I just thought, oh, I've had enough. Don't want to do this anymore. You know. Uh, I didn't realise at the time that I was suffering from depression uh and anxiety but i was i was in quite a bad way and to be honest i was probably ill for around about 10 years after i left antisex with those two conditions mm -hmm. i'm sorry to hear, i'm sorry to hear that pete but do you think maybe you were like going through a lot of depression and anxiety because in in that early age just being so politically active and playing shows doing all kinds of political activities like changing the world and it, you, it didn't get the chance to maybe focus us on your personal life maybe partly yeah partly it could be that uh well it, it, it would have probably been some of that but i think as well it was just sort of struggles that i was having internally you know in my own head uh oh. being, being a young man you know I remember i was only 17 at the time that we made the in darkness album uh so i was only yeah, barely barely an adult really uh and i suppose i just became mixed up and uh, the worst thing is is that i didn't really speak to anyone about it you know being a young lad you know i couldn't go to one of my friends you know i couldn't imagine turning around to one of my band members and saying you know what i really feel depressed today because i just wouldn't have done it you know i couldn't i couldn't even accept myself that there was anything wrong i just tried to put a brave face on it they call it smiling depression. Yeah, a lot of people have had it. Uh, uh, but yeah, it, it drove me mad almost. And like I say, uh, I was probably about 10 years. I was probably sort of lost in the wilderness. Uh, 
you know, uh, I managed to pull myself together. Uh, I don't suffer like that anymore. You know, I think I'm a lot older, uh, probably a lot more settled. But it was a horrible time. Yeah, very horrible time. Uh, I get a little bit sad when I think about it because I lost 10 years of my life and they were, you know, sort of all, all through my 20s, really, you know, and I'm never going to get that time back. But I don't dwell on it. I just think to myself, well, you know, that's what's happened. I had to deal with it. Uh, and it's probably made me a better person. It's made me who I am. Uh, and I think now I'm very, very mentally uh, strong, I think, because of it. So, you know, you've got to think of it as like, you know, good coming out of bad. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this, Pete. Um, maybe because it was a different time, maybe you couldn't talk to people like that at that time. But um, speaking of dirt, what, what was, um, I just got an email from a Facebook message from Dino yesterday on Facebook, because I, I, I was okay. talking about that before. What, what was playing with dirt like? Dirt were a great bunch, yeah. Yeah, uh, I remember Gary and Dino, uh, can't remember any of the other guys names i'm ashamed to say uh but yeah they they were a great band good good people to good people to play with uh we did a few gigs with them and yeah great brilliant band uh, at that time didn't one of the members used to on date on uh, dirt singer from dirt dino from anti-sec yeah yeah i think lippy dated her but that was that must have been after 85 it would have been after oh, i'd well. left the first time round. i'm sure yeah but I, I i i'm aware that uh that dino and lippy had a relationship of some sort at some time but i can't comment on it too much because okay, i don't okay. really know anything about it sorry i thought it was you for some reason sorry no, also oh uh, no, no it wasn't me i'd probably have liked to <laughs> crucifix do you remember crucifix from, from america Tell us yeah, some of your members yeah. playing with Crucifix. Uh, Crucifix were great to play with because they were just again another uh, another wild band, you know, really not, really good live, a nice bunch of lads, and we had some great fun with them. Yeah, we 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 did. Uh, I think we did a couple of tours with them, uh, and the plan was was that uh, they'd come over to the UK and tour with us, and then we were gonna visit the States and uh, do a tour with them over there. But uh, things being the way they are, it just, that never sort of happened. You know, I think people's lifestyles and it just made it almost impossible to sort of get our act together to sort of organize a US tour. So it never happened back in the eighties, which oh, is a shame that, really, because I think it would have been great. That, that would have been amazing if, if you guys um, came in, in the eighties. 80s to America. I did. I did see some of the fo photos and stuff of, of, of anti-sec and crucifix stuff, and also I saw yeah. some of banners on your photos. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Got the uh, flux banner there. As well. All the different banners you guys have and stuff. What happened yeah. to all these banners? Banner drops. What happened to them? Where did they go? Yes. No idea. Honestly, I, I I I don't know. They would have been the sort of thing that have probably lost over time, or maybe somebody's got them somewhere. I I, I really don't know. Okay, we have more questions for you. Okay, but before we get into all the other questions, my friend texts me some questions too. I wanna, I don't want this to be all political too. But I also noticed you guys used to have that crazy hair. Yeah, like you had that crazy hair too because all uh, my hairstyle comes from early amoebex and anti-sick how did you yeah. how did you do yeah. your hair crazy back then yeah yes yeah, it's not a lot like that now is it <laughs> no like hairstyle tip from the old days how did you do your hair all that crazy oh it was all like back combing back combing and hairspray uh, I think at one time I might have had uh, like some dreadlocks at one time, but I didn't like them. Uh, I probably had kept them for a few weeks and then had had my head shaved, got rid of them all. But I, yeah, I had hair a bit like yours, Jay, at one time. But also there was other times when I sort of had pretty boring normal hair. I think really as well, you know. Oh yes, I think, I saw Pete, too. I think Pete Lyons and Polly had much much better hair than me, definitely. Yes, Polly had the craziest hair ever and stuff. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, he, he just had image all, all over, really, didn't he? Yes. I got a text from my friend, Brandon from Headdress. He asked mm -hmm. questions for you. Yeah, fine. Um, Headdress is a peace punk band from Southern California, and this is from Brandon. What got you into playing music and being politically minded? Okay, uh, well, getting into music, as I say, it was like young lads. We hadn't really got anything, anything do we hadn't got jobs or anything there weren't a lot of jobs around in the 80s back then and uh we just sort of as i said earlier we decided to get into a band and uh we just sort of put a lot of work into it the political thing i suppose again that comes back to bands like crass we uh we got involved in crass and you know they sort of just blew us away and uh yeah, and we sort of ended up moving more towards that sort of an arco sort of side of the uh, of the punk genre Oh, this is my question, because you, you mentioned about jobs. If you guys didn't have jobs, I'm just curious. How did you guys get money for food or just to survive? We signed on the dole. Oh, OK, OK, OK. Yeah. I mean, basically, we signed on the dole, uh, but we were sort of working full time with the band. I think this is one of the reasons why Antisect were, I mean, you got to remember it, we worked hard at it. We worked really hard at it. We took ourselves quite serious and we weren't the type of band where we'd sort of say, oh, well, no, we won't bother having a practice this week. We practiced religiously, you know, every week. I can remember the, the big times when uh, none of us drove uh, and we had to get all the kit to our rehearsal. And we, we, re we rehearsed at a place in Daventry called the Band Hall. And I can remember uh, me and Lippy, I'd get to Lippy's house, order a taxi, and we'd load all the gear in and we even had like a PA with something like, I don't know, these five or six foot tall speakers. We used to have to say to the taxi driver, can you put the seats down, please, mate, so we can get all the kit in. <clears throat> and that's what we used to do. And we'd arrive at the uh, at the uh, <clears throat> the practice place. Uh, Polly would be pulling up in another taxi with his drum kit. You know, so it was quite funny, really. Uh, but we practiced and practiced and practiced. And like I say, we used to spend a lot of time where we'd just sit up at night, just chatting, writing lyrics, writing songs. And uh, I spent quite a lot of time in the library in Daventry as well, because again, not having jobs, not having a lot of money. Uh, it was a place where we go, where we got left alone. And we just used to pick up books and we just read through stuff and we just try to educate ourselves and we just get ideas and, you know, I think we were a we were a pretty hard working band, really. You know. Okay, Brandon also wanted to know what was your favorite songs off of "In Darkness, There's No Choice" and why. My favorite song off "In Darkness." <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> uh, let me have a think. My favorite, I think, probably be the book stops here. Because I think the, uh, the, the the vocals from Rich Hill are just so, so powerful. Uh, the subject matter was, you know, powerful as well, really. Uh, and, yeah, that's, that's probably one of my favourites. I also liked uh, Heresy. I always thought that was a, a good song as well. Oh, yeah. I, I like that song, too. He has two more questions. Oh, it's the same question I asked. What are you doing to stay sane during quarantine? To stay sane? Uh, well, as I said earlier, I'm still working. So it's not like I've got all day, every day, uh, to, you know, stuck in the house. When I'm at home in the evenings or at the weekends, I mean, we just had the Easter weekend, which was a, a four day weekend, quite a long one. I must admit, I found myself getting a little bit bored by the end of that because we couldn't go anywhere. Uh, anything really, uh, my base, reading, uh, going on the internet, being with the family, uh, just all those sort of things, really. Mm -hmm. And his last question is, what was your most memor memorable gig? What, with Antisect? Yes, with Antisect. <clears throat> That's a hard question, Jay, because there was probably like so many of them. 
Uh, I think probably the gigs, I think we did a couple of gigs at the ambulance station in London. Uh, they were just just awesome. I mean, because, you know, from what I recall of them, it was just a, a, a great place, you know, a real good atmosphere there. And I think we played quite well, as if I recall. And uh, that was great. The other memorable gig is more recent uh, with the Reformation, uh, 2000 Reformation, sorry, 2011 Reformation even, uh, when we played our first gig after 24, 25 years uh, at the Puntula Rocks Festival in Finland. Mm -hmm. That was just fantastic. You know, we were so nervous because we hadn't played together for so long. Uh, but we got on the stage and I think we pretty much smashed it. We had a great time. I think the crowd had a great time and the people were just great. The Finnish punks were just brilliant. Great, great people had a really good time. The place I'd like to visit again someday, maybe. Okay. Um, Peter, I also posted on my Facebook if anybody had any questions. So I'm yeah. going to read a couple questions from that. So yeah, after the yeah, question, sure. yeah, after the question, then we could talk about why you didn't come to America and why you. Um, <clears throat> We could talk yeah. about that after all these questions, okay? So here, here are the, this question is from Greg, Greg Bull. Um, he's from your area, England. Greg lives just down the road from me, not about 20 oh. miles. Oh, you guys are friends? Uh, y yes and no. I mean, I don't know Greg that well uh, personally, but we're sort of friends on Facebook. And I remember Greg because, oh. uh, yeah, he, he played in a band called Sedition. Uh played guitar if I remember with rightly and we did a couple of oh. gigs. We did we did some gigs with them back in the day. That's not to be confused with I, I believe there's another band called Sedition, uh the base Scotland maybe, if I remember rightly. Yeah. But this Sedition were from were from Northampton and obviously that's literally 10, 12 miles from Daventry where Antiset were from. Anyway, Craig's question. Oh, do you know Mark from Sedition? Yes. He stayed with me when he came to America. Mark Davis, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was the drummer. Yeah. Okay, Greg's questions, kind of a little long. What, what was his favorite gig he attended as a member of the audience? Any special memories of anti-sec gigs? Does he have any mem memories of the Hackney Hell crew or antidotes? Most bizarre anti-sec gig. Most scary anti-sec gig. Right, which bit would you like me to answer first? Whatever you feel like answering first. You don't have to do it well, in order. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so my most memorable gig as uh, a member of the audience. Mm, lots of them. Loads and loads of gigs. There were so many that I could think of. I mean, I'm thinking about all the bands like The Damned. Polly and myself, we sort of went on tour with the Damned, sort of like uh, followed them around as much as we could, seen them quite a few times. Uh, other bands that I'm thinking about, you know, like this, again, like the UK Subs, The Roots, uh, Slaughter and the Dogs, you know, all sort of great old punk bands. But I probably think probably one of my most memorable, uh, <laughs> probably for all the wrong reasons, would be a gig that I went to uh, see Slaughter and the Dogs at in Birmingham, the Dick Pacific Hall in Birmingham. Uh, Slaughter had a little bit of a skinhead following because they had a song called Where Have All the Boot Boys Gone? Not sure if you're familiar oh, with yes. it, but uh, yeah, well, they, they they had a bit of a, quite a big skinhead following just really because of that song. Well, at this gig, uh, I was there with a couple of mates, again, probably only 14, 15, and uh, I love Slaughter the Dogs. They were, they were one of my favourite bands. And uh, anyway, down the front in the mosh pit, giving it some as you do. And uh, the whole sort of crowd sort of went over. And uh, <clears throat> I sort of was getting crushed by loads of people, you know, quite scary. But anyway, I managed to get myself up. But as I stood up, unfortunately, my foot had got stuck in the pocket of the skinhead's crombie jacket. Yeah. And as he stood up at the same time, his jacket just went and it ripped all the way down and i thought to myself oh shit i'm dead anyway this guy sort of turned around and he just punched me straight in the throat and i literally just sort of like you know i was down and i thought straight in the throat yeah 
and I thought I was going to get like a real good beating off him and his mates. But fortunately, this guy was enjoying it and he sort of jumped back in and left me alone. So I got away with it. That's probably sort of, yeah, I've, you know, I remember that really well. <laughs> Funny. Funny when you look back. Uh-huh. The other part, uh, asked something about the the, uh, the Hackney Hell crew. Yes. Yeah. I sort of remember. Remember the Hackney Hell crew? They would have been around at some of the gigs, certainly some of the gigs that we did around London and that. I, I can't say that I really knew any of them personally because, again, I probably think that anti-sex involvement with them would have been after 85 when they moved down to London uh, and sort of, you know, were sort of living in squats and that with probably the, the Hackney Hell crew. So I can't really say that I knew much about them. Mm-hmm. He also has most bizarre anti sex gig and most scary anti sex gig. Bizarre and scary. Bizarre anti sex gig. Ooh, that's a hard one. Let me come to the scary one. Uh, we had a few, <laughs> a few like that, where uh, we did a gig in Peterborough. Uh, and yeah, you know, it, it, quite a lot of people turned out. It was a pretty good gig. I think we played all right, from what I remember. But there was just a little bit of a funny atmosphere at that gig. Didn't quite sort of feel right. And I've got a feeling, I could be wrong, but it might not have been that venue. But I'm sure it's Peterborough. It was sort of pretty much by the end of the night. We were sort of running to the van with our guitars and drums to get out of there as fast as we could before we, you know, before we got our heads kicked in, basically. Oh. Uh, that was yeah, that was pretty scary. But another time we played at uh, a, a venue in Birmingham, again, uh, Dick Pacific Hall, where I went to see Slaughter and the Dogs, but it was a little sort of smaller venue that I had downstairs. We had a lot of skinheads turn up at that gig, uh, and they really just turned up. They didn't turn up because they liked anti-sex. They turned up probably because they wanted to beat the crap out of us, more than likely. Uh, and I can remember a couple of these skins getting on the stage while we were playing and just basically just been pains in the ass, like, you know, looking for trouble. Rich Hill, uh, credit to him. I remember he sort of stood his ground with them. You know, he weren't going to be intimidated by him. None of us were going to be intimidated by him, really, but none of us wanted any trouble. Uh, Rich sort of stood his ground with them, and they sort of they sort of backed down and uh, left us alone. But, yeah, quite, quite scary at the time, though. I really thought we were going to, you know, going to see some trouble at that gig, but fortunately we didn't. Wow, that's really strange. During that time in the 80s in England, there was no cool skinheads, like anti-racist skinheads or uh, skinheads who were ha- cool skinheads who were hanging out with punks. There was no skinheads like that? Like skinheads were hanging out with anarchists? No, there was. No, there were, there, were, there were skinheads like that. There were skinheads that were really, that were really okay. You know, my, my own sister was a skinhead at one time, uh, oh. and she certainly was never racist or anything like that, you know, loved the oh. reggae music and all that. Uh, and I also had a friend, uh, one of my best friends, still my best friend to this day. Uh, he, he was a skinhead. You know, he wasn't sort of racist or anything like that. They weren't all like it, but there was a lot of them that were. You know, it was a bit of a... I suppose, like a herd mentality, you know, especially at gigs where, you know, people were drinking and things like that. There was there was always things that could kick it off, you know. And I, I've seen quite a few, quite a few instances of skinheads wrecking gigs, really, you know, for people that would have otherwise just gone there peacefully. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, I was just wondering if there were skinheads like that and they will back you up at shows. And, but, okay, next one is from Robert. Robert used to play for Holocaust or Robert Hamilton Samuel. His question is, on the LP that has two different live gigs, one on each side, what was the lineup on the early side and are there any other recording from that era of anti-sex? Uh, is, is he talking about the pieces better than a place in history album? Yeah, it has to be because that's the only li- live yeah. album. Okay, well, side one of that album was recorded in Nottingham, if I remember rightly, and it would have been pretty much exactly the same lineup as the In Darkness album. Uh, I don't think Caroline appears on any of the tracks on that album. I could be wrong. Uh, so for some reason, she wasn't. She'd either left the band or she wasn't there for whatever reason. But yeah, it would it would have been the same as the In Darkness lineup. So myself, Lippy. Oh. Uh, Polly, Rich Hill, and Wink. 
Okay. Uh, next question is from Marlon Chach. Uh, he's from Los Angeles. When they made a transition from the old punk sound to the heavier metal crust sound, was that a direction the band was heading on it on it own? Or was was it the following other bands who were playing the more heavier metal crust sound? Uh I wouldn't say we were necessarily following anybody else. It was, I think it was probably more of a natural progression for us, Jay. Uh, you know, we, we'd all liked the heavier bands. And although we were all sort of young punks, none of us were just into punk music. We liked lots of other different stuff. We were all like big Motorhead fans. Uh, Polly liked a lot of uh, metal bands like Venom, uh, Iron Maiden and things like that. And... Uh, I think as the years sort of went by, we probably just got better at playing our instruments. We probably became better instrumentalists, better songwriters, and it just seemed that natural pro progression for us to move to a more heavier sound, probably because we were able to play it. Whereas before, we could only play a bit of D beat. We could probably play something that a little bit, you know, a little bit more intricate, a little bit more involved. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, next one is from Nicholas Royals. Vegetarian still in question mark. Okay. No, not a vegetarian. Uh, if you recall, Jay, you interviewed me a number of years ago. Yes. Uh, your DIY zine. Yes. Yeah. Back in 2002, was it? Uh, I don't know. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, so, something like that. And I think you asked me the same question. No, not a vegetarian. I haven't been a vegetarian since 1987. Uh, so quite a long time, really, 30, 33 years, is that? Uh, I don't really want to go into too much detail on it here today because I just don't think it's appropriate. Uh, you know, I'm not going to pretend that I'm anything that I'm not, uh, but I've just got a totally different set of views towards that type of thing than I had back then. You know, when we recorded the Darkness album, as I say, I was 17 years old. Uh, I was a vegetarian at the time. I'd been a vegan as well at some period. Uh, you know, and I felt that strong about things that I wanted to write songs and sing about it. Uh, unfortunately, now, 40 years down the line, <clears throat> I've got a, a different set of, uh, well, a different sort of live view, really, I suppose. Uh, and I have to say, I would never be a vegetarian again. And I'm sorry if that upsets anybody, you know, I don't mean to offend anybody. You know, I've got a lot of friends that are vegetarian, uh, which is why I don't really want to say too much, because, as I say, I don't think this is the time and the place, really. But I can understand the question being asked, and I'm not surprised that that question's been asked. In fact, I was expecting it. Yeah. Oh, Pete, oh, just to let you know, I have friends to this day who used to be veggies in the 80s and 90s and who are not anymore. So it's... <laughs> I don't judge or anything, yeah. but um, I think when you are, I think when you asked me the question, it was something along the lines like that, Jay, about uh, you know why do you think so many people have gone back to eating meat? It was, you know, if I remember rightly, yes. it was a little while ago. Yeah, it's just one of those things, isn't it? But like I say, I've got a lot of friends that are vegetarian, and that's why I don't want to start saying, look, this is what I believe, this is what I think, this because I just think it'd be inappropriate. And as I say, I'm not here to like upset or offend anybody, especially any of my friends. Okay, cool. So then, anti sick got back together, and and mm -hmm. the shows you guys did was in somewhere I forgot some festival in Europe, and Caroline was there on the video. And yeah. When that <clears throat> yeah, that that was that that was the the Puntula Festival in Finland. Yes, <clears throat> I'm talking about that one. And Tim Tim Andrew came in. Yes. Who did the vocals? They know when it got heavier. And then yeah. you were doing vocals, and I was so happy to see Caroline there. But how come she didn't sing at the live show or did any poetry like how you guys used to do? <sighs> Caroline, it's it's funny actually because when I was asked to reform back mm -hmm. in 2011, the first contact I had from anyone in the band was actually from Kaz. Yeah, she rang me up one day uh -huh. uh, out of the blue and said to me, you know, we're, we're thinking about getting the band back together. Would you be interested? And I 
you know, I didn't have to think about it for too long, if I was honest. I, I probably jumped at the chance straight away. I'm thinking, wow. yeah, you know, a chance to do that again, get back in there. <clears throat> you know, it's brilliant. So anyway, <clears throat> cut a long story short, uh, we are arranged to do uh, a, a band practice, a, a studio in Milton Keynes, which was sort of somewhere central for all of us because we've got people that were travelling from like London, from, you know, the Midlands, wherever. So we did this practice. Uh, Kaz came to that and we tried a couple of songs uh, with Kaz doing some of the backing vocals like she'd done on the on the album. Mm -hmm. I thought it sounded great. I loved it. You know, I, I love Kaz anyway. She's one of the most caring, nicest people you could meet. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Pete Lyons, Lippy, decided that he didn't feel that there was a place for Caroline. She should, couldn't fit in anywhere, which mm -hmm. I don't know why, but that's what he believed so we'd already sort of arranged sort of to play the finland gig and the plan was that it was, was that kaz would be sort of part of that gig so she she came over there with us but because we'd not practice anything uh you know with her on vocals it just never really happened but lippy sort of he was a little bit i, I didn't quite like the way he treated her if i'm honest jay because you know, to say Caroline's a fine person, genuine person, couldn't meet a nicer person, really. And Lippy had just got this thing in his head that he didn't want her around. And, uh, you know, he was just going to get her out of the band. And that's what he did. Because wow. from the early live recording, a lot, lot of the anti-sick anti fans will know this, but like from the late recording when you were in it, oh, she was doing so many vocals. I was so happy. Like, yeah. You, yeah. you and her were going half half and then towards the music when it was going slow she would do poetry it yeah. was like amazing yeah brilliant yeah she was great Wonder again you know it, again it brought another dynamic to the to the music to the sound didn't it you know and i was always happy to have kaz on board but anyway she came with us to the uh to the show in finland but unfortunately uh never made to the stage and it's quite funny because i can actually remember coming off the stage and a couple of people saying to me you know where's the girl where's the girl uh, you know and People were expecting her to be up there, but she wasn't welcome. She wasn't welcomed by Lippy, unfortunately. He didn't he didn't want her there. I'm sorry to hear that. But then you you mailed me the seven inch. Um re, you guys did re I mean re-recording of the four four minute warning. Uh, oh right, the ten inch, yeah. I mean not, I'm sorry, the ten inch. I wanted yeah, to Yeah, did I send one to you, Jay? Did I I can't remember. You send it to me. There was no covers. There was no no artwork. It no, was just... no. Well, that that's how we sold it. Yeah, it was sold oh, like that. Yeah, it was just yeah, like a, a black or a, a white sleeve. If I remember rightly. And and then I was listening to it. It was a really clean clean studio recording because mm. you guys used to sound <clears> so powerful. Then the recording was so clean. And I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, that's all yeah. songs sound so powerful. Then it it like it was different. Yeah. <clears throat> it's horrible, weren't it? <clears throat> oh, my friend. Um, my friend just um text a question right now. Okay. From Insta Instagram. This is Jacoby from Beginning of the End fanzine. He wanted okay. to know: Was there any live footage of the Darkness era that you know? Was there any live uh, video footage or anything? Not and that I know of. Uh, the the only time that I can ever. <clears throat> Yeah, in darkness. I know there was some later stuff uh, with anti-sect. Uh, no, no. Thinking about it, I don't think anything exists. There's nothing that I know of footage for those sort of in darkness uh, from that in darkness era. None that I know about. Wow, I'm blown away. All those many shows you guys played, nobody filmed it. I mean, I back know. then, I can imagine <laughs> camera must have been like, so heavy and big. Yeah, yeah, we didn't have like, we didn't have mobile phones back then. It'd have been so different if we did, or you know, if we'd had the internet, it would have been a lot different. Yes. And then from there, you guys were about to come to America. Oh, yeah. by the way, I love that lineup because you guys got Tim Andrew and everything. And mm -hmm. it's, I saw it on YouTube. It sounded good. Everything was powerful. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. you wrote me, and you said you're gonna come to America on the tour. And mm -hmm. said, come, um, and why did you leave the band and, and decided not to come to America? 
Uh, <clears throat> an unfortunate series of events, really. Uh, partly, you know, the thing that I mentioned with Caroline earlier, sort of being forced, gently sort of forced, pushed out of the band. I wasn't very happy about that. You know, that, that upset me greatly because, you know, you don't treat people like that, especially your friends. Uh, lots of other things going on. <clears throat> uh, it came to light uh, probably about two or three months since the Reformation. Lippy rang me up one day and he sort of dropped a bit of a bombshell on me. Uh, he told me that he, he contacted Southern Studios sort of at the back end of the 90s. Somebody had tipped him off that they'd been down to the warehouse and they'd seen a load of anti-sex CDs and, uh, you know, they'd mentioned it to Lippy. Lippy was obviously interested. He got in touch with Southern and uh, it turned out that Southern was sitting on uh, a load of royalties for the In Darkness album. Uh, the royalties were handed over to Lippy. Uh, obviously, the understanding was that the, the money would be shared out amongst all of the, the members that performed on the In Darkness album. But he kept it all to himself. Never bothered to contact anybody. Uh, I think he only admitted to it because uh, he probably thought he was going to be rumbled, that, we, that I was going to find out about it. Uh, so it was probably better that he told me. I did say to him at the time, you know, I was I was upset. I was very upset because I just thought, why would you do that? I, You know, I, I would not do anything like that. I wouldn't dream of doing anything like that to an enemy, never mind, you know, a friend. Uh, so that was one thing that sort of was building up. And then uh, sort of a little while after that, uh, we had a sort of band meeting, spent a day together and uh, we're sitting there. And I think it was Lippy and probably Lawrence, the bass player, that started talking about a self-financing uh, a tour in the States, <clears throat> tour you're talking about, and also in Japan. Uh, and it was decided not agreed by all of us, it was decided by them, them too, that uh, they were going to sort of take care of all the finances for the band uh, and we weren't going to share any money out at the end of gigs, there weren't going to be no nothing for anybody, everything was going into this little pot. Well, to be honest, Jay, you know, the alarm bells are ringing in my head so loud, you know, because how, how could I trust Lippy to like look after all the band's finances with the backing of like his close friend, uh, you know, knowing that he'd, he'd taken the royalties like he did. And, uh, you know, that was one of the things that sort of built up over a period of time. And it sort of, it made my position in the band untenable, really. Uh, just before the US tour, uh, we'd got a, a gig booked, I think it was in Belgium. Uh, it was probably about February, March 2012. Uh, unfortunately, I had to go into hospital for an operation. I'd got an injury that I had to had to get sorted out, uh, and obviously I knew I was going to be off for uh, you know two or three weeks off work, and obviously I wouldn't be able to do any sort of anything with the band. So as it sort of started to get nearer and nearer towards this uh, this this gig, Lippy came to see me in Daventry. We went out for a drink at one of the local pubs, mm. and. Uh, I just sort of said to Pete, look, I don't feel I'm going to be ready for this gig next week. You know, I just I just don't feel like, you know, I'm fit enough to do it. So I was expecting, OK, maybe we'll just cancel the gig. I'm not saying that I was that important that they couldn't do it without me because they could. But Lippy's words to me were, we're not canceling that gig. It's 1,500 euros. And that's the exact words that he said to me. And we sort of, we ended the meeting pretty much there and then. And I think he must have seen by my face. I didn't really say anything to him, but he would have, he would have known from my face. I was absolutely, I was just gobsmacked, absolutely gutted, you know, really, really upset. And I just thought, well, if that's what you think, you know, then you can forget it. And I think that was pretty much the point when I said, uh, said to myself, that's it, I, I'm not going to continue on with the band i'm not enjoying it i wasn't enjoying it and that's pretty much when i uh when i left jay oh wow wow i'm sorry I'm, I'm sorry to hear, hear all that stuff but um yeah well it's 
it's it's just the way it is. There's no point in worrying about it, is there? I know what what happened with the band. It's not my business. But since you both been no. friends for friends for so many years, yeah, is is it possible you got you both could sit down again and just forget about the band, like you know, talk to them and forgive them and stuff? Or is is that possible to be friends again? Or is that? Uh, I don't like, know. I really don't know. I mean, I, I, I'll be honest. I don't hate Pete. I don't even dislike him, if I'm honest. Uh, you know, I, there's a lot of things that I respect about the guy. I mean, he's, he's a highly intelligent guy. Uh -huh. He's got what, charisma, which you probably know yourself from, from meeting him in the States, Jay. Uh, but like I say, I don't hate him. I think, if anything, I pity him. I pity the guy uh -huh. because he's just deluded. Um, actually, when Antisa came, I mostly talked to T Tim Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> I was mostly talking to Tim Andrew. I didn't really talk to Pete. Uh, I didn't, we just say hi, bye, how are you? That, that's yeah. fine. We didn't really, we didn't really yeah. talk that much because I, I just felt that um, awkward what, what happened with you guys and stuff. So I didn't really talk to him, like sitting sure. down, nothing like that. But yeah, yeah, yes, I had a chance to talk to other members. And yeah, Tim and Tim and Drew and I talked to both Lawrence a little and, and stuff like that though. Yeah. Because yeah. you did you did a little video, didn't you? That you put on YouTube, if I remember rightly. I think I've seen it. Yes, with, it uh, baby Lawrence. Yeah, but yeah. Pete wasn't in the video. I, I mean, I recorded it. No. Live. I don't have anything against Pete, but I just kind of felt the we like strange. Like, I mean, not strange because. Okay, yeah. That because you didn't you didn't come and stuff. I actually thought you left the band. I was going, oh man, he, he left he left the band band and stuff. So oh, what you was expecting me to be there was you. Yeah, but I remember getting an e e email from you, message from you saying that you were you were no longer in the band, and you you made a post and stuff, post and stuff like that. <clears throat> but yeah, yeah, I, I really hope someday you both could sit down, even if the. Even without talking with the man, work things out because you guys have been friends for so many years since you guys were your team yeah. and stuff. It's kind of which, sad. Is, it, which is, which is, I think, one of the reasons why I think I was sort of upset when I found out about the royalties. But obviously, so were, so were the other band members. You know, the original members that were uh, that were all involved in the in darkness. You know, if if there was any money to be had, it should have gone to all of us equally. Simple as that. You know, yeah. it was actually. Lippy try to justify it by saying, well, you know, we wrote the song, so we we would get more money anyway because we'd get writers royalties as opposed to uh, wow. performers royalties. But at the end of the day, there were six of us that were involved in that album. That money should have just been split six ways. Simple as that. Unfortunately, yeah, I, mean, yeah. It wasn't. I do that with my band too. Like, like any gigs we do, we just do collective or, or collectively share it all. Well, that's cool. That, yes. and that's how it should be in, in my opinion yeah yeah even with merchandise even like if, if i pay for it other and pay for it after i break it even we just do all like co collectively equally d distribute our shows sure. and stuff, you know? <clears throat> yeah, so which is what bands do yeah yes oh i know i know i told you this since a lot of people don't know um, I got the band's name, Resistance Exists, from anti -Sex. From our song. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I thought. <laughs> I told you that a lot of people don't know that and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. When, when you, how come you didn't continue to do music when anti when when you were no longer involved with anti -Sex? What, the, the second time round or the, the Just any of them, even round. now. Like, did you, how come no, you didn't I continue did. to write uh, stuff? No, oh, when, when, I, when I left. When I left the band in 85, uh, I actually started playing bass just shortly after that. And I played in a few bands. Yeah, played oh, in a wow. few bands, uh, mostly sort of covers bands. Uh, not, not punk bands, more sort of like classic rock, you know, Hendrix, that type of stuff. And yeah, I've always sort of had a little little dabble off, you know, got I've got some mates that are, that are musicians, you know, and we have a little jam and that every now and again. So I've, I've, yeah, I've always been interested in music, but I've I've got no desire to sort of be in bands nowadays. I just I think I'm just too old for it. Just no desire to do it. Age is just a number. What about Charlie from UK Subs? 
<laughs> well, I know, but Charlie's a one-off. You know, Charlie's a one-off. And I mean, what is he, 70 something? And, uh, you know, brilliant. You know, but, you know, Charlie can carry it off. Not everyone can. And what about your writings? You, you had so many. Are you still at least writing? Because I loved your writings and stuff in the old days. Uh, uh, <clears throat> no, not really. No, I don't really do any writing. I do a lot of reading, but I don't oh. do any writing. What suggestion would you give to the kids who, who want to start band and stuff? I would say work hard. Don't give up. You know, certainly don't take, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of knocks. There's going to be a lot of hard times. Uh, you know, being in music, people think that, you know, you're going to make loads of money and you're going to end up rich. And, you know, that, that happens to very few people. Uh, most most of them, uh, most bands are sort of pretty poor, you know, but uh, you can sort of make it or you can get there just by hard work, perseverance, you know, uh, keep playing, keep practicing, get as much experience as you can, you know, play with different people, play different genres of music, do everything. You know, that's, that'd be the advice I'd give. Uh, maybe have lessons, you know, that's something that I've always regretted doing. I wish I'd sort of taken up guitar lessons or bass lessons like years ago because I'd be a lot better playing it than I am now. Just a quick question. Would a band work if you don't work too hard, just do it as a side project? As like a hobby, would that work too? Or oh, not? yeah, of course. Yeah, of that's course. Well, yeah. yeah, sure. <clears throat> but I mean, you were sort of saying any advice to bands I thought you were, you meant, yes. you know, bands that want to sort of get somewhere. Yeah, you've, you've got to work at it. But no, I mean, I, I know a lot of people that uh, that play in bands that just do it as a side project, it's a hobby. You know, they enjoy doing it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think it's brilliant. You know, if they enjoy playing the music and people like listening to it, then, you know, brilliant. Bring it on. Oh, sorry, because the reason I mentioned this is because I read the Crass book and Steve Ignoran said at the end, it, he did so much that it took so much of his life. He felt like, and when the band was yeah. over, he didn't know what, what to do what to do and stuff. And I was going, wow, that's kind of scary. Yeah. Focus too much in the band. It takes your personal life away. So that's all I was asking. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. Chris, Chris, my friend Christian for Manic Relapse Festival. Sorry, I have a phone set up here too. He's on um, Instagram and he says, Christian for Manic Relapse Festival and Corrosive. He wants to know, do you think there is a future for live music? I think maybe because... Do I think there's a future for live music? Yeah. Yeah, of course there is. Uh, I mean, you know, Music, you know, it, it's one of those things, you know, you, you either love it or you don't, you know, but I think most people like music and uh, I think people like going to, to see bands. I know I certainly always have. Uh, unfortunately, it's quite expensive for people to go and see bands nowadays, especially the, you know, the, the more well-known sort of mainstream bands. Uh, but now I think live music will carry on, you know, or, you know, yeah, it should. Oh, maybe he could be mentioning this because I was, me and him were text, texting earlier before I did an interview with you because we were thinking that there's going to be no any live show this year or next year in America, in Cal I mean, in California because of all the right. uh, things that's going on. Yeah, sure. We, with the, you mean with the COVID thing, Jay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I hope so. I mean, I hope, I hope, all, you know, once all this is over and, uh, you know, the world gets back to some sort of normality. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope, hope bands are going to get back out there. Also, looking forward to the pubs opening again, if I'm honest. Yes, because um, I was talking to him earlier. We were texting back and forth. We were also worried about venues getting shut shut down after when this is over and stuff. We are going, oh, are the small restaurants going to get shut down if they can't pay rent, if this continues to go longer and the ven venues and stuff? <clears throat> yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's just a thing generally throughout sort of any industry though isn't it really jay if you think about it you know that there's, there's going to be loads of people that are struggling in this country when once this is all over there's already a lot of people that have lost their jobs uh and i can see why somebody that's into live music would be concerned about it because there's probably going to be a lot of the live venues that will go under as well because they're not bringing in any revenue they can't keep going they're just going to end up in debt and like going bus which is a shame but, yes uh, especially for small things the small yeah. 
the stuff, independent ones. Yeah. Also, before before all this happened, right before all this happened, did you continue to go to punk gigs and stuff? Or well, it, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I mean, when when I when I left anti sect in eighty five, oh. I didn't go to a punk gig for quite some time, to be honest, because. I think probably because of my mental health and everything, uh, I sort of, I, I changed, I had to change my life. I had to do something, you know, and I sort of, not only did I really leave just anti sec but I sort of, it's almost like I sort of left punk. I had to sort of move away and do something else. I, I had to, I, I had no choice. But sort of after that, probably towards uh, the late 80s, yeah, I started going back to gigs again, yeah. Uh, lots of gigs, really. You know, I've always liked seeing bands like Stiff Little Fingers. They sort of tour pretty much, you know, every year. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and still go to gigs now to this day. Yeah, definitely. You know, wild, wild horses wouldn't keep me away. Okay, that's good. Do you ever, like, run into friends you haven't seen for many, many years and you just run into them? I haven't seen them for, like, 30 years. And you run into them at shows, and they look totally different. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's fantastic when that type of thing happens. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. crazy as well, isn't it? But especially if someone you haven't seen for like you say for thirty years or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's always great though, you know. But I always think, you know, I've, I've always loved live music. Uh, I've never been one that liked going into clubs or nightclubs or anything like that. Uh, it was always always about going and watching bands, you know. Big bands, little bands, you know, all sorts. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is from Santanga, Santangalo. I'm oh, sorry, I have my phone up here too. Um, from Instagram, he's, Santangalo says, what do you think of the scene now compared to what it was like then? Well, in the UK, I mean, it's, it's totally different. Uh, there's probably much more of a punk scene going on, you know, in your part of the world, Jay. Uh, you know, in other countries in Europe, they've probably got big punk scenes. I don't think there's a massive punk scene in the UK like there was. Uh, but, yeah, it's still still there. It's still going. There's still some good uh, some good venues. You've got places like the Fleece in Bristol, where Antisect played 2011, 2012. Great venue. You know, really good. Uh, quite a few people turned up for it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think there is still a punk scene, but it's nowhere near what it would have been, you know, back in the 80s. No, no way. You know, most of them have grown up. Okay. Also, i got to tell you something funny, okay? When I was in high school, I first heard the, heard the In Darkness on a cassette tape. And I was going, okay. yes. And I go, what the hell is this? The song doesn't stop. It keeps going. Not stop. I, I I first could not get into it, but later I I didn't like, like it at first, but later on I fucking loved it. It took me a while to get used to it. Then the album The Void Seven Inch came out, and I got so fucking angry when I first heard it because I was still in high school. I'm going, what the fuck? These now they're totally different sounding. It was like too heavy back then in the '80s to hear that. It was like metalish. Years went by, years and years, years and went by. I love that seven inch. It took me so long. Now, yeah. <laughs> new, now the new album came out, and I, I listened to it. You know which album I'm talking about, right? The new one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because anti Sig was always like beyond the time or something. But the new album came out. I listened to it. I was going, what the fuck? I was listening to it. I was going, this is so fucking different. I don't know. Maybe I might change my mind in 10 years from now or five years. Did you not like it? <clears throat> I, Did you not like I mean, it or... No, I, 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 I can't. I couldn't get into it. it was so different, yeah. and all the anti sex <laughs> I listened to from the beginning to the time, I could not get into it. But later on, I loved it. But new yeah. album, I couldn't get. What, what's your opinion about the new album? Maybe I might like it later, though. But what's your opinion? I mean, I've I've listened to it. I've streamed it on the on the internet, and uh, yeah, it's. <laughs> some of it's okay uh some of it isn't you know i i, I don't think it's uh ever going to be sort of called a classic album or anything like that uh the sound is very different as you say jay to uh what we sounded like back in the 80s but again that's that's down to lippy you know that's what he wanted and that's uh that's how he's made the album it, it is lippy's album it's not i've always thought 
you know, that is an anti-sect album. Didn't even sound like anti-sect. That's that's Lippy's album. You know, he's reworked a couple of old songs from <clears throat> back in the eighties, uh, and he's written new songs. Uh, but no, I, I wouldn't say it was brilliant. I'd say that bits of it are okay. There's one song on there uh, that I like, uh, something to hate. Oh. I think that's quite a sort of punky thing. And I have to laugh. I mean, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Lippy wrote that song about me. I'm pretty sure. That's my belief. I could be oh. wrong. I just think, like, music, just music-wise, he, he became better, uh, what do you call it, better at it and stuff. Because yeah. I was going, I like that when things were simple. Why is it so complicated? Yeah. <laughs> like, you well, know, that went from a sort of a D beat band to a sort of a sort of punk metal crossover and then to that album, which is again so radically different to anything that we did back in the eighties. You know, I mean it's got like helicopters whirring around in the background and which I always thought was a bit well, you know, didn't didn't really do anything for me. Uh but on the whole, I would say it's not an album that I particularly like. Uh but you know, that's that's what it is. It's a shame because people waited for it for a long time, uh, you know, and I think it was a disappointment to quite a lot of people, but some people love it, you know, and that's just the way it is. Yes, and I noticed the change, the album had all color, color and stuff and all that. And I thought Tim Andrew, I thought Tim Andrew would be on vocals and I was like, oh, Tim's not in it either. Tim left with that. Tim couldn't be in the band and everything and all that. Wow. Oh my gosh. We, we went... Over an hour on the interview, we almost did like hour and 20, 20 minutes. Oh, I'm gonna stop the clock. upload it on, on my YouTube and stuff. Oh, yeah. I just want to say much respect to you, much respect to all the anti sec members, and, and much respect to um the new anti sec too. But I hope someday you both could sit down and sort things out or talk, and somebody apologize, and you know for being getting to know each other from since like childhood it's kind of shame if people are not talking and stuff but it, it, it is a shame because it's sort of it's sullied the name of the band a little bit i suppose you know uh but you know shit happens jay uh what what more can i say mm -hmm. do you do you have any last comments before we go uh no, not really. I'd just like to say thanks to you for, you know, for like offering me the chance to interview me. Uh, you know, I've uh, got a lot of admiration for you myself. You know, I know you're sort of quite an active guy. Uh, I like, you know, some of the Resistant Exist stuff that I've heard as well. Uh, and no, not really anything else I want to say, mate. Hey, by the way, we did one of your song cover from Alf on the Void. Yeah, I know. I heard it. Yeah, I heard it. In fact, I posted it on the anti-sect and official Facebook. The, the, I had a sort of period where I, I sort of became obsessed with like covers of our songs. I don't know why. I just always think, you know, <clears throat> if somebody must like a song that much that they take the time <clears throat> to bother covering it, it uh, you know, it's sort of quite humbling, really. So I can remember, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking around uh, sort of YouTube and that for covers. And there's surprisingly, there's a lot out there. And, uh, I, you know, I know, sometimes I post them on, like I say, I post them on my Facebook page. Uh, but yeah, I know you've done a cover of Out from the Void. Good cover as well. Not bad at all. I know this, but like I said earlier, when I heard that in high school, I got so angry. I hated that song, but it took me many, many years. And I go, wow, I love it and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Before we go, I ask this to everybody, everybody, um, this question to all, everyone. Any life advice for youngsters who are in their 20s, early 20s and stuff? Any advice in life in general? Believe in yourself. Don't take any shit off anybody. Resist and exist. Cool. Thank you very much for the interview. I'm going to upload this tomorrow on YouTube. It's going to take a long time to upload it because I'm almost <laughs> hour, over an hour, 20 minutes. Right, hour, 20 right, minutes. Okay. Well, th thanks very much for uh, contacting. And hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, chat again soon sometime. Yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll sustain touch a bit more. I'll keep in touch with you online. Yeah. Take care. Okay. 
and well done with these little videos that you're doing as well. They're uh, they're good. Hopefully, <clears throat> you know, might bring a bit of entertainment to somebody. You never know. Yes, because we're in a lockdown. I'm temporary out of out of job job, so I'm just giving entertainment to my friends and stuff, yeah. so they can look at it. So thank you very yeah, much, and yeah. have a nice yeah. evening. I'll keep in touch with you online. Take care of yourself. You too. Take care of yourself, Jay. Cheers. Thanks very much, mate. Cheers. Bye. -bye.